Greetings and welcome to podcast number 15 of Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. We are moving out of Act 2 and into Act 3 and we're very, very on our way to getting completed. This is a big book. It's a big, heavy worded book and it takes lots of time to read. So let's move on to World's Greatest. Hollywood kept calling. I did Gotham City, a hit for Batman and Robin, and two songs for Samuel L. Jackson's redo of Shaft, Batman, and Up and Out of Here. Best of all, the producers of Ali asked for a song. I knew I had found a groove that would float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. I knew I had to call it the world's greatest. I knew the words would have to honor this man in a way that make us both proud. I pray for the right songs and God bless me right away. I am a mountain. I am a tall tree. Oh, I am a swift wind sweeping the country. I am a river down in the valley. I am a vision and I can see clearly. If anybody asks you who I am, just stand up tall. Look, look them in the face and say, I am that star up in the sky. I am that mountain peak up high. I made it. I'm the world's greatest. I'm that little bit of hope when my back's against the ropes. I can feel it. I'm the world's greatest. I am a giant. I am an ego. I am a lion down in the jungle. I am a marching band. I am the people. I am a helping hand. I am a hero. When the film premiered in Chicago, the arrangements got messed up and I found myself far from Muhammad Ali's entourage. When he found out, he sent word and had me sit right next to him during the showing. Man, you talk about a brother being proud. To have any connection with Ali was the honor of honors. There's a big connection, Robert, said Muhammad Ali, because you got Sam Cooke in your soul. That connection is strong as steel. As the movie showed, Ali and Sam had been close. Sitting next to Ali was bringing me closer to Sam. I always had it in my mind to do something for Ali that he remembered forever. The World's Greatest was a cool song, but it didn't convey everything I felt for him. A few years later, the idea hit me like mine. His birthday is in January. I'm the 8th, he's the 17th, and I thought of the best birthday gift I could possibly give him, an evening with Sam Cooke. I planned a live concert at my house where I'd play the part of Sam. Living room is a large is as large as a ballroom, and for this special night we built a stage right in my living room. The first person I invited was Ali, but when I learned he couldn't come, I arranged to film it and send him a copy with a card that said happy birthday to the greatest. I invited about a thousand people and told them to dress in period clothing. I made my band study the original arrangements for all of Sam's best hits. I brought in backup singers and dancers and shared no expense. I dressed in a black tux and black bow tie and for an hour I became Sam Cooke. I sang my heart out for Ali, knowing that this was his man. But when it came time for a change is gonna come, I have to stop and talk about me and my mother. How she tell me that one day my change would come and I'd entertain princes and kings. Far as I was concerned, there was no royalty more regal than Ali. No man more instrumental in instilling pride and courage in young black men. After he watched the video at his home in Louisville, he came, he called me to say that the show brought tears to his eyes. You sure Sam ain't your daddy? He asked. Pretty sure I said, will you sing like his son? I've never had a nicer compliment than that, I said. All influenced me to do something I'd never done before. It happened in New York City where I was booked in a popular late night talk show. They were putting on my makeup when I looked in the monitor and saw the show host watching dogs do flips through hoops. After the flips, the trainer, a white guy, went to the couch to talk to the show host. He said some funny stuff, and it was a good interview. I started wondering, after I sing I Believe I Can Fly, am I going on the couch? No, said my manager, you just sing, no interview. Why? We just want to sell records. We don't need an interview. But what if I want an interview? If the dog trainer can be interviewed, why can't the singer? It doesn't make sense to me. 
Don't make trouble, just sing. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted to just sing. I wanted to talk to the host. After Ali came to mind when he was told what he couldn't do, he flat out refused to accept it. He lived life on his terms, not the unfair terms offered to him. That's what made him a leader. On the monitor, the announcer was saying, up next, R. Kelly. No, R. Kelly was not up next. R. Kelly was out of here. R. Kelly, R. Kelly was leaving, getting into his car and going to McDonald's. When the driver was about to pull away, the woman producer ran after me. Mr. Kelly, she said, don't worry. We will be glad to interview you. I went back in and went on TV, sang my song before walking over to the couch. In his hip style, the host cracked at me. I'm my own style. I cracked back at him. We kicked it for a while. It was cool. My point had been made. Mm, he's building his self-worth. Okay. The 90s was nothing but hits. So I was eager to start off the new decade and fresh millennium with even more energy. I wanted to make more impact. I wanted my first record for the 2000s to be something that referred to the past, but defined the future. I wanted it to be the album that showed all sides of me. And that would appeal to both male and female fans. I called it TP2.com, the 12 plate tradition, which really started with Born Into the 90s, was continued, but this time I was taking it to the next level. The first single was released was I Wish, a song I planned to do with Tupac. I originally wrote it about a friend of mine who I supposed to had gone out to the club with, but I'd been so caught up recording in the studio that I told my friend to go on without me. He died that night in a car accident and I wrote the song. I thought it would be perfect for me and Pac. You hear Tupac's flow all over the way I sung, spoke the verses. The drama is about loss, not only the loss we felt when Tupac um, left this earth to go to a better place, but the loss we feel whenever a homie has moved on too soon. Violence is an ugly thing, and I wish is a prayer for all violence to stop. Fiesta was the next single to break out. On the album, I had Boo and Gotti rapping. On the remix, Jay-Z came on board, and we had a, a smash hit. Because TPT... Two dot com was the official follow up to 12 play. I couldn't ignore the sexual theme strip for me pretty much represents the whole concept of the album. I couldn't imitate or just redo 12 play. I needed to figure out how to mic it directly, but still be the same thing at the same time. I also had to continue the realness. So I had to flip it. So on strip for me. Instead of a girl stripping for me, I pull the switch, girl. I say, I'm a strip for you. On the intro to TP2.com, I start out, hit it hard from the back, roll around on the front. I know you heard a lot of tracks, but 12 plays what you want. When you're talking sex, it doesn't get more real than that. This time I wanted to try to get a more out there, but the same time really being a little bit sarcastic, but creativity at the same time saying, Hey, I know what you want on the greatest sex. I paint the scene on a bigger canvas. It's great sex. Yes, but it's spiritual sex where the love making leads to the birth of a child. When I wrote it, I told people it felt like a sexual, I believe I can fly or a sexual inspirational song. At the same time, some of my music is comical. It's almost, it almost feels sex sexual. But if you listen to it closely, it's really funny. Feeling on your booty was a com 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 comedian sexual song. Yet there's still a real song in there. You've got to be very silly to sing it and you've got to be silly to love it. I like to make people laugh and have fun. When you go to church, if the pastor at some point don't make you laugh, he probably ain't going to make you join. You've got to have a joke or two in there. You got to do something to keep the crowd. On tp2.com, I also wanted to show people how I was and feel the street in me, not just the romantic hells or the inspirational Kell. The song R&B Thug is about that. It's straight to the point, the streets of Kells, where I grew up. I'm from the dirt, and a lot of people didn't know that. When they hear happy people, or I believe I can fly, it throws them off. I wanted the girls at the same time. I wanted to let the guys know, no doubt about it, Kells is hood. 
I wanted to show the street side of me. I'm not a rapper, so I had to do it my way. I wanted to conclude TP2.com on a high note and leave the listener with a message of hope. I wanted to let my fans know that no matter what they might be going through, a better day was coming. I pulled all that emotion in a new anthem called The Storm Is Over Now. That song is the veg it, the vegetables that go with the meat and potatoes. Sometimes my music confuses people. I don't want people to think, well, Kells is just confusing me. He's gospel. He's sexual. He's trying to do too much. But I believe in balance. No matter what, I believe in good. I believe in bad. I believe in ups and downs. I believe in partying. But then I believe in church. That's what the storm is over now is about. What I didn't know, though, was that the storm had just begun. A storm like nothing I had ever seen before. Act three, in the ring. When you get to be a best-selling entertainer or a public figure, you're opening yourself up to attacks and lawsuits. When you're R. Kelly, everybody wants a piece. If you don't give them that piece, they'll find a way to get it out of you, one way or another. After you have lived long enough in the spotlight, someone will claim you did this while another person will swear you did that. It's all part of the game. I knew that coming in. During the 90s, I got hit with a bunch of lawsuits from several people making false claims. These suits were called nuisance claims. And according to my attorneys, it will cost me more to fight the suits than to settle. The smartest thing would be to minimize the cost or I'd wipe up spending 10 times the amount fighting charges that can simply be settled out of court. I followed my lawyer's counsel, but those suits were not about the truth. These people knew damn well that I hadn't done what they claimed, but they had hooked up with slick lawyers and were only about getting paid. I didn't like doing it, but I settled. I've been blackmailed a million times in my career. I've been sued for ridiculous stuff that defies common sense. I can't say I'm used to it. You never get used to it. You just learn to accept it. A superstar becomes an ATM, especially if you're the only star in your family. Everyone wants something from you, and most people feel you owe it to them. Buy me a car. Buy me a house. Furnish my house. Buy me another house. It's It goes on and on. When you help your homies, they don't think you've helped enough. So they dish you in the press. All that MFN R. Kelly thinks about is his MFN self. For years, I tried to balance being a responsible family member and loyal friend against the crazy demands of the part of folk trying to play me. It always seemed like if I gave someone anything, it was never enough. If I gave them a lot of money, they wanted more. If I gave them more, they disappeared until they ran through what I gave them. Then they were back with their hands out. Not everyone was trying to use me. Certain friends and family members showed me love without attaching a price tag. They never asked for anything. They were concerned about my welfare, checked to make sure I was okay, not to see what they could get out of me. I loved them even more for their genuine care and affection. Devotion minus the money motive equals pure love. Anyway, that was the 90s. Lots of annoying lawsuits, but they were all pretty much handled easily. But, but then in 2002, an H-bomb was dropped after someone sent to the Chicago Times a video that supposedly showed me having sex with a teenager. I was arrested and accused of child pornography. It didn't matter that there were real questions about the authenticity of the video or that the girl the prosecutor's claim was on a video insisted no way it was her or that both her parents, her grandparents, and several family members said the same thing. R. Kelly had a reputation and R. Kelly had to pay. So what if that reputation was a fictional creation of a crazy ass music video? Sexy concert performances and off the hook media hype that had nothing to do with who Robert Kelly really was. R. Kelly was going down. I was looking at penalties involving long-term jail sentences. If I was found guilty, my career would be ruined in a single blow. Everything I ever worked for had been would be taken away. I'd be taken away. My kids would see their father as a criminal. 
I knew the charges were bullshit. I knew I was innocent, but none of that mattered. The press had a field day. News outlets began generating rumors and innuendo based on anonymous tips and interviews with supposed lovers, former employees, and associates who validated the charges against me. The media spread the lies with lightning fast speed all over the world. It was presumed I was presumed guilty long before my trial. The flurry of uppercut jabs and body blows was unstoppable. Before vowing not to participate in the media circus, I reacted like a woozy boxer throwing wild punches, hoping to slow the assault. In 2000, my manager and I had parted ways. I thought we parted on fairly decent terms, but then I heard he had sent a letter to reporter Jim Derogatis at the Sun-Times, claiming that he had suggested I get psychiatric help for my supposed sexual addictions. I never found out if it was true, but it bothered me. I don't have to tell you the wheels of justice grind slowly. Man, this case grinded so slow, I thought I'd lose my mind. Nearly seven years, seven years of having to ask the permission of the court whenever I wanted to leave Chicago. Seven years of lies, folks scandalizing my name, depicting me as a devil. Seven years of living with the sharp edge of guillotine reportedly hoovering over my jugular. Seven years of sleepless nights and scary dreams. I was facing jail, financial ruin, the end of my career, the loss of my fans, and the loss of all respect and love. Seven years is a long time to be facing that kind of nightmare. To be honest, I felt like I was already in jail throughout those years. A lot was taken from me. My pride, my dignity, my passport, a hell of a lot of money. It was a hell I wouldn't wish on anybody. Throughout the ordeal, comments from many of my advisors went like this. Rob, you got to put a hold on your recording. Don't tour until this legal mess is behind you, Rob. Robert, this is not the time to come up with sexy songs retreat until this thing blows over. The public isn't ready to accept any new material from you, Rob. Everything you write or say will be viewed under a magnifying glass. Better to say and do nothing. I disagreed. The advice came out of concern for me, but I knew myself better than anyone. I couldn't see myself sitting around for years twiddling my thumbs while lawyers fought with each other and court dates kept getting post postponed. Truth was, if I was going to survive this ordeal, I needed my music to get through it. I had to sing, I had to write, I had to produce, I had to tour, I had to connect with my fans, I had to work with other artists. Rather than retreat, I had to re redouble my efforts, and I did. For those seven years while I was under this dark legal cloud, I went out there and did more creative work than in any other period of my life. I might have done twice as much work. I turned the fear to energy. I went to work with a vengeance. Sometimes negative situations can make inspiring positive ones. Struggle feeds passion. It fed my music. If I focused simply on the negatives I was going through, I would have just broken down. I didn't. My music held me together. Not only did I need the outlet, the release from the anxiety brought on by these charges, I also needed the pure joy that comes when I'm writing a song. I needed the love that comes when I'm singing a song. I needed God and God lives in my songs. God is strongest in me when I'm writing the melodies that he puts in my heart. You're wrong, Rob, said one advisor. You're exposing too much yourself. You're making yourself more vulnerable. Good, I said. The more real that I am, the more powerful my music will be. In the face of the charges, I was determined to sing even louder and prouder as I set out to make the most powerful music of my life. The more real that I am, the more powerful my music will be. Welcome to the Chocolate Factory. I call the log cabin the beating heart of my recording studio, the Chocolate Factory. For many years, the Chocolate Factory was nestled in the basement of my home in Olympia Fields. The Chocolate Factory was my sanctuary, a place I could escape to when the weight of the world was bringing me down and the weight often had me on my knees. The log cabin was where I recorded. It's, it's made out of logs and different woods. It's small, intimate, and cozy. There is nothing fancy about the log cabin. I use the same mic I've used for years. I sing my vocal rights there. 
I see my vocals right there where the engineers are sitting so that I can give them instructions, play something on a keyboard or play one of the many instruments I keep close at hand. Because while I'm singing, I'm also writing and producing. In Log Cabin, you'll also find my main engineers, Ian and Abel, and my musical director and guitarist, Donnie Lyles. All of them have worked for me for years. While I was hard at work in the Log Cabin, prosecutors were working overtime to build a bulletproof case. I can't tell you how many of the people making allegations were there at one time or another, the same people who had asked me for some sort of favor. A few of them were just pissed that I told them no. Sometimes people presented themselves as friends or allies and then straight up lied. I couldn't figure out why I was the only one who understood their motives. If someone messed up and you have a fire and you have to fire them, of course they're going to be mad. The money they were getting, the fame or whatever disappears. So anything that comes up about you, they're going to run and say, yeah, he did that to me. Or yeah, I know that about him too. I tell people who I thought were close to me, listen to the facts. If you're going to have an opinion about something, make it your opinion. But whatever you do, don't go by something said by somebody pissed off because they didn't get what they wanted from me. Thank God I had the chocolate factory. It lifted me up. It was a safe place where I could create and reach for the sky from my basement. As I faced the biggest challenge in my life and a brutal legal battle kicked off, I wanted to respond positively. I wanted to offer my fans and myself a big box of musical chocolates. I called the album Chocolate Factory and designed it in gold foil with a bright red ribbon on top. Before the album came out, though, I wanted to release a single that explained where I was coming from. My life was on crutches, but I knew I'd walk again. I had many thoughts boiling up inside and I needed to get them out. Mostly, though, <laughs> I needed to talk with my mother. I missed her so much. That's why heaven, I need a hug. Start with these words to her. Dear mama, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through, but still I got my head up just like I promised you. Ever since you left, your baby boy's been dealing with problem after problem. Tell me, what am I supposed to do? See, I get lost sometimes, don't understand this place. So look in the mirror sometimes and see a troubled face. And then my tears roll down and hit the sink. Then I hold my head up high. I hope the man upstairs can hear me cry all these questions deep inside my mind like if jesus loved me why'd he leave my side mama i'm trying to get the answer why you were young 45 you had to die i'm always trying to help people out and it seems those same people trying to take food out my mouth it seems like the more money i make the more more drama y'all try to create the more i try to move into the positive the more y'all don't want me to live Heaven, I need a hug. Is there anyone out there willing to embrace a thug? Feeling like a change of heart. And all I need right now is a sign or a word from God. Shower down on me. Wet me with your love. And I need you to lift me up. When I was through mixing the single, my people were telling me not to release it because of the court case. Most radio stations had stopped playing my music. Naturally, that made me mad. That meant they presumed I was guilty. I was already being punished. This was the song, Heaven I Need a Hug, was so important to me. But that's why you can't put it out there, said advisor. Why? Because they'll use it against you. What's to use? All I'm doing is praying to my mother and God for guidance. I'm just singing what's in my heart. They'll twist it against you. They'll just say that material to make you look bad. You'll do better to find yourself a preacher and start meeting with him. We'll be sure the newspapers know that you'll be a great, you've got a great spiritual advisor. I've always had spiritual advisors, starting with my mother and continuing with Pastor Lena McClinn, but I'm not going to hook up with some well-known preacher to make me look good. I'm not going to use a preacher to help my image. My image is in my music, not some phony public relations stunt. <clears throat> look, Rob, 80% of all radio stations have banned you. Put out this song and it'll be 90%. Listen to me, I'm right. I didn't listen to him because I felt he was wrong. When my fans heard my songs during that trial by fire period, I didn't want them to just hear a singer. I wanted them to hear a survivor. To me, it's not just writing songs, it's writing life. Whatever the story, emotion, the calling is at that moment, I feel obligated to share it through my music. I put out Heaven, I Need a Hug and the response was strong. 
Radio stations played it because my fans wanted to hear it. They heard my sincerity. They saw I was wearing my heart on my sleeve and they started to send me thousands of notes and letters. Little by little, I started to get airplay again. The hottest song on Chocolate Factory was Ignition. I revisited the metaphor I started with. You remind me of something, a woman in a car. I liked it so much I had to break off a remix and put it on the same album. In the remix, the groove got very danceable while the metaphors mixed together. It's the remix to Ignition, hot and fresh out the kitchen. Mama rolling, that body got every man in here wishing. Sipping on coke and rum, I'm like so wet, I'm drunk. It's the freaking weekend, baby, about to have us some fun. See, you can't even say those words together without putting it in that jingle. You've lost your mind, Rob, <laughs> the exec said when I told him I wanted to release Ignition Remix as my next single. You can't release it with those lyrics. I can't change the lyrics. I said, why? Because they go with the song. They go with the mood. Maybe, but you've got to change the title. Given what you're facing now, you can't sing about sticking your ignition and your key in the, in the ignition. I don't see why not. They'll crucify you. I think the jam's so hot that they'll have to play it. I said, I think I'll get you ban I think it'll get you banned worse than before. I didn't believe that. So I sneaked to cut to sneaked a cut to a DJ and asked him to test it on the air. That same night, his phone lines lit up like a Christmas tree. People went crazy for it. I immediately made sure it was released all over the country. And the next thing I knew, I was sitting on top charts again. The ban against me had been smashed by the power of music. Ignition turned out to be a monster hit. It was important to me during that time to remain true to myself, to not sing about sex the way I'd always sung about it would have been an admission of guilt as far as I was concerned. Since I wasn't guilty, win, lose, or draw, I was determined to stay true to myself. I was back. Chocolate Factory sold more than 3 million copies. But in coming back, I wanted to show all sides of life, love, and struggle. I also wanted to give something back to my city. As the case against me lingered on, I received letters and messages of support from all over the world. But in Chicago, I received a special, familiar, soulful kind of love. The kind that just keeps stepping to you, no matter the betrayal, hard times, struggle, or doubt. I wanted to give the world the smoothest example of stepping, a Chicago dance style that I love. As I explained at the beginning of the remix of Step in the Name of Love, stepping is more than dancing. It's more cultural. It's a way of life. It's a choreographed romance, a special mellow feeling that flows between a couple when they're out there on the dance floor. When you step, though, you step in the name of love. That's the important part. You're not just stepping to score with your lady. You're stepping and grooving in the name of love, and God is love. You're stepping, but you're also feeling his spirit, his grace, his rhythms, and his holy rhymes. You go round and round, side by side, separate and bring it back. And if anyone asks you, we did it and we did it for love. That was my strategy. Beat the accusers, beat the prosecutors, beat the haters, beat them all with love. They didn't understand if you were hating on them. I got you beat because I'm going to keep loving on you. People kept asking, Rob, how is it you keep doing what you do with all this drama surrounding you? It may sound weird. But I just keep on stepping, keep on creating, keep on loving. Love, l love lightened my load. Once I knew my people were with me, I was going to feed them the biggest R. Kelly banquet ever. I was going to supersize my musical menu. And the same year, the Chocolate Factory dropped, 2003, when I turned 36, so that the R&B Collection Volume 1, a double disc, hot out the kitchen suite of remixes. As the court case built, as the accusations piled, I knew I had to keep moving. I had to keep on moving. I had to stay focused and strong. I knew I had to keep playing um, hoop, keep releasing energy, and keep going back to the chocolate factory and making music. Love lightened my load. Okay, that is going to be the end of podcast 15, Solar Coaster. Um, and the, this is the very reason why I chose to read the solo coaster or diary of me by R. Kelly for R. Kelly appeal TV, because I had never read it until now. And I feel that in doing so, 
it has opened up an understanding for me personally to feel the energy of Robert Sylvester Kelly as he was going through the character of R. Kelly. And like I said in some of the earlier segments, I think podcast one or two, I said that it is important for us to get to know the person, get to know the energy behind the emotion, how he's this way. And uh, as we hear the compilation of charges were building upon him during this particular time. And I believe that um, it was truly because when you take people off payroll and you fire them, I'm a CEO, a director of my own company. And when I have to let people go, it is just that way. They begin to slander your name. I remember, I can recall many of times where it didn't get as big as a lawsuit, but it could have. And I'm not nowhere near as famous as R. Kelly. Right? So, so I can see them getting so angry and so frustrated that they would go and uh, manipulate a story because we do have a lot of manipulators in this world and they come in all shapes, sizes, uh, genders. And so what are your views about this um, segment here? This podcast is more real and is more connected, but all of them were. Every podcast that I've done for Solar Coaster has awakened a new understanding of what R. Kelly was really going through. And I'm thankful that he wrote this book. And um, I believe it's going to go down in history. I'm gonna, I, I do believe it's going to be a history book. If any historian who is in the 21st century um, educational system, this should be part of history class, you know, because it teaches us what we need to know as men and women when we hit that threshold of celebrity status, what to do. Um, yeah, so I thank you guys for being here. And I believe that I'm going to be able to knock out the rest of the book. Um in about maybe three more podcasts because they're very heavy words. And as I read them, I'm trying to make sense. And then I'm putting you in mind. So as the listener, being able to understand what I'm saying. Um, so yeah. So after we're done with Solar Coaster, we're going to move into the appeal process again, and we're going to start to begin the collaboration and connection and bringing it all together with what's going to go on with attorney Bond Jean's motion the filing should be coming up very soon as far as the um determination of what the courts are gonna you know present as a rebuttal to um or not rebuttal but as a as a statement of fact to Bonjean's motion so we'll keep an ear out on that as well thank you so much for joining liking subscribing and we will see you next time <music>